I have brought a few slides. It's not a very big paper because the time may not allow me to go uh, too much. Just the outlines I've discussed with you, and if you if we talk, perhaps we'll have to talk more. These are all you know bullet points that I'll share with you. <coughs> Here we are looking at look east policy uh, uh, and uh, northeastern India. First of all, I want to show you the map of Northeast India. Because it not Yeah. You see this this place. No? This this is West Bengal and the rest of India. Then comes Gavati, that is Assam, Nagaland, uh, uh, Imphal, that's Manipur, Aizawl, Mizoram, and Tripura. This side you have Sikkim and Orunachal Pradesh. See, all the states are border states, and these are border. These states are bordering with Burma in the west, Tibetan Ch uh, China, this Tibetan portion of China in the north, Bangladesh in the south, and the the mainstream India in the east. This connection is very thin, and, and this is Siliguri Pass, as you know. The Siliguri is a place, and this is a twenty. 22 kilometer uh, this pass which connects the northeast to the rest of the country. This is the only geographic connection that we have. Others, other part is East Bengal, that is Bangladesh today. So <clears throat> this is how Northeast India emerged as a region in the in the course of time. After the partition of the country, as you know, the, when India got independence in 47, there was partition. India was, didn't get the full country as independent, Pakistan in India. And East Bengal, that is Bangladesh today, was a part of Pakistan. Although there was no uh, you know, continental connection between East and West Pakistan. But and that particular, that creation of East Pakistan, that is today's Bangladesh, made the northeastern region landlocked. And it lost all the maritime uh, uh, connections. Uh, Chittagong Hill, uh, Chittagong had a big port, and there are many other ports, there are many roads this side and that side. But then now, after the partition of the country, main portion went to Bangladesh, and, uh, so, uh, and so it became landlocked in many ways. And that perhaps was the reason for this privileging the region from. Uh, larger economic benefits, <coughs> particularly trade and commerce. We know that uh, this region had a very, very old trade connection with Asia and Southeast Asia. Those who were not, uh, you know, after this partition, this didn't happen, they had to surrender these benefits. Now, <coughs> uh, coming back to the bookist policy, I'll call it LEP, LEP. Uh, you know, that, uh, this policy emerged in 1950s, after, after, after after the independence of the country, but for quite some time, for quite some decades, this policy was suppressed. There was no talk about the policy, even in international studies. Suddenly, from 1998, 1998s onward, we started to think about, talk about this policy uh, for in, in, the, in the larger context of economic liberalization in the end of Cold War. Now, <coughs> this this policy has no white paper. This is the this is the tricky thing in the policy. We call it policy, but if you say that well, it should be the policy, no chance. We cannot show it. It's a policy. There's imagined policy, and this policy is now uh, <coughs> um, uh, now accepted the government uh, as a major policy, which is implicating northeastern part of India in a big way. <coughs> uh, increasing search for trade and investment in 1990s uh, and integrating uh, Indian market with the larger uh, Asia Pacific society, showcasing India's potential for investment and trade, greater sensibility towards the small countries in Southeast Asia, Recognizing ASEAN's Association of South Asian Nations political role, cooperative defense and regional security became the major landmarks of the Look East policy. The policy has a multifaceted approach. It includes economic, it includes diplomacy, it includes 
politics and a lot of things. It includes development, trade and whatnot. I will here discuss three major contours of this policy as relevant to North East India. Just to, to bring down the discussion to focus on North East India, these three contours are regional groupings for economic bonds, governance and peace building, and third, trade investment in infrastructure. These are the three things that I would like to share with you. First of all, I will go to regional groupings for economic bonds. As you know, <coughs> uh, just after independence, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, took initiative for regional cooperation. There was a big conference uh, in, in New Delhi in 1947, uh, in which uh, the then Indonesian President Sukarno and Chinese Premier Jawaharlal Lai came and then they agreed to build up a regional cooperation. Uh, but that, that was one, one era of history that was immediately after the independence. But now these regional groupings have, have become much more significant in the reform era. In the reform era there arose the need for a new set of cooperation. India intended to rebuild relations with Southeast Asia that led her to become sectoral dialogue partners and then full dialogue partners to the ASEAN Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The larger regional groupings like the CERC, South Asian <coughs> and ASEAN had more than economic dimensions and post-independence India sought to for diplomatic maneuver beyond the South Asian confines. Indian ties with South Asia began paying off in the meeting of heads of the Asian states and the Indian government in Phnom Penh in 2002. In the look East policy regime in the reform era, multiple sub-regional groupings appeared, having deep implications for the North East India. Some of these sub-regional groupings are Asian Regional Forum that tried to build bridge between South and Southeast Asian region, address development issues of the volatile Northeastern region, create sub-regional energy grid, and to tackle other security issues. So Asian Regional Forum is one such sub-regional grouping. Beamstick. It has, a, it has a history, it started as a BSTEC. Myanmar didn't participate at first, but later on Myanmar came and became BIMSTEC. Later on, uh, this BIMSTEC uh, and the signatory is Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Thailand. This is called economic cooperation. Now, this is the, this BIMSTEC has matured into B of Bengal Initiative, BBI. Then there is other uh, <coughs> sub-region groupings like Ganga Mekong Cooperation, which was launched in Vienta and the Cooperation. India, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam were the signatories. The other one is bilateral cooperation between India and Myanmar, which aimed at establishing cross-border transport and communication infrastructure and improving trade and business trials. The next one was South Asian Business Forum under South Asian Sub-Region Economic Cooperation. Question. So, when was the South Asian Business Forum formed? South Asian Business Forum. And which countries is. Uh, well, let's is see. Uh, South Asian Business Forum. Uh, this included uh, these five South Asian countries the uh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, India, Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Right. So South Asian. Was there any um, uh, um, what do you call it? Was there any initiation uh, with Southeast Asia? I mean, d desire to develop networks of business relations. With these Southeast are these Asia? are all for that. The right. All, all, so all the initiatives are meant for network building, security, development, and defense. Right, but with Southeast Asia. Yeah. Was South, there because here, look East policy. One good question is that. No? You see, if you go deep into the, the details of the policy, it implicated both South and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. It's not only Southeast Asia, it's also implicated South Asia. Let's say Bim State is basically South Asian phenomenon. Right. Whereas, whereas your, your um, business forum also is like that. But then there are other uh, co cooperation which goes beyond South Asia and includes Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, like that. So. One of the important things that you can see uh, in sub-regional groupings is that it is not necessarily South Asia focused. It also, uh, you know, includes 
South East Asia. Both. So, uh, so this is the this is the this is the thing that's going on. This regional cooperation. Of course, there are many questions why there are so many regional groupings. Uh, it doesn't work. Some groupings are emerging and you know, busting like bubbles. Why do we do it? But then still there are you know kind of such kind of things. Sorry, when was this developed? When was the, the, the South Asian business form? I have not put the date, sorry. Okay. I have to say it. I think perhaps we need questions for the end yes. so that sorry. the speaker can continue. Then uh, agreement on consular access between <coughs> India and Bangladesh. This is an ongoing process because Bangladesh and India are very close and there is border is loose and the wire fencing is there. You can just jump over the wire and come in, inside India. Uh, but but these are illegal, considered as illegal <coughs> migrants. <coughs> so uh, recently, uh, Bangladesh has shown interest to uh, to settle the border issues and to check the uh, border migration from the country. And India has uh, also agreed to this. South Asian Growth Triangle includes Bangladesh, seven northeastern states of India, West Bengal, Nepal, Bhutan, as new sub-regional framework to act outside the SARC framework. We've seen the SARC is a bigger framework, regional group. But these are, these are still more, smaller uh, you know, regional groups which, which are pro being promoted outside the SARC framework. And you will see there are some organizations which are uh, de being developed outside the, uh, even the ASEAN framework. Small, small groupings are coming up. So, <coughs> uh, uh, Asian Communication Network. This is also, you know, Union Province, China, Northern Myanmar, Northeast India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. So these are the things that are coming up. Bangladesh, China, India, and Myanmar, BCIM. It's called BCIM Forum. Uh, in fact, Kunmin Initiative is not comfortable in here for India uh, because of a very uncomfortable relationship between India and China, the border issues. But nevertheless, it didn't stop India to include the Chinese phenomenon in regional cooperation. This is a <coughs> this is uh, slightly complex because India is very suspicious of the border. China is also like that, with the border dispute still persisting. But um, but so far as uh, you know, other trade related relations are concerned, uh, China cannot be you know, ignored in any case. Perhaps this is the reason why uh, this this Chinese phenomenon is still. Very important uh, for understanding. Now, <coughs> noticed Bangla Business Conclave. It was recently, uh, recently concluded, and that is to improve the trade ties between uh, Northeast India and Bangladesh. It will implicate the, the state of Tripura and this uh, Meghalaya uh, much more than the other states like Nagaland and Bombay. Now, <coughs> Such regional formations had the following features. It implicated both Southeast Asia and South Asia. If you see the structure of these regional groupings, it implicates Southeast Asia as well as South Asia. This is a combination of both the regions. It proved these, these um, groupings, regional groupings, proved easier to achieve progress and customize with more flexibility. The argument in favor of is that these are more flexible this can be customized, this can be an easy relationship between the countries and all that. <coughs> the, the, and the third reason was that it was less time consuming than the larger, more, more cumbersome multilateral, multilateral negotiations. If you look into multilateral negotiations of WTO, it's very big, very complex, lot of, lots of formalities. But these are simpler, easier. And that's why they found that these are these may be uh, the the alternative to, to, to the cumbersome multilateral organizations and uh, relationships. <coughs> um, but all these groups have a common interest of trade promotion and economic cooperation. These are some of the things that I want to share with you. So far as these regional groupings are concerned. Now, the second point is on governance and peace building. This is very significant in, uh, so far as the policy is concerned as well as the uh, Northeast India as a whole is concerned. Uh, I just want to give a background of, of, of the, of the, of the unpeaceful situation in Northeast India. Uh, various types of 
uh, violent, uh, you can say, uh, uh, militant activities in North East India. And if you go in details of it, you will see that not only armed violence, but also other kinds of violence are very common in North East India. Uh, and you know there are so many groups coming up. They demand sovereignty. They demand autonomy. They demand, and they say to come out. They, they talk of coming out of India. So these kind of movements are there in, in, in northeast India, almost every part of the country, of, of the region. Now, these movements need money, need resources. So they need to raise money, and in order to raise money, they can do whatever it is: arm race, gun running. Uh, this, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 this uh, uh, drug, drug, gold, and armaments, smuggling. Hmm? So smuggled economics <coughs> is a parallel economy. You know, and also, uh, recently, one of my friend, uh, friends have done a good work in Tripura. He said that this pornographic terrorism, the, 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 the uh, groups, the insurgent groups, they photograph the pornographic activities uh, in multilingual with multilingual driving sold in Southeast Asia, South and Southeast Asia at higher price. So this is all resource mobilization theory of social movements. And then, uh, <coughs> so in this way, no, you see, apart from weaponized violence, there are other kinds of violence in this region and that is very, very difficult. Uh, perhaps we can say that these violence, these things are, are, are the other side of globalization. You can say the subaltern globalization is happening in a very bad way. They are not into the mainstream globalization, but this, and that is why peace and governance become very significant in this particular border region of the country. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, it was a common concern for all the regional groups, uh, even the international bodies, like, uh, all the international bodies, UN bodies, and, uh, they all feel it deeply that governance and peace building are the, are the first pillars of development. If your area is disturbed, nothing can be done. Everything will be destroyed. Now, <coughs> when Lucas policy came, uh, it, it worried the government and the policy makers because Lucas policy wanted to promote economic development and to and to promote through trade uh, and you know uh, industrial trade industries and you know exports and all that. So Lucas policy needed uh, needed governance and and that's why the policy makers are worried about it. <coughs> Uh, the problem with, with the region is that the international borders that you, have, you see are porous. Uh, and that is, uh, that, that is why these, these borders have made the region much more vulnerable. <coughs> Anybody can come, anything may happen. If you see the indo burmese border, uh, border areas, so there's no restriction. So BSF is there, border security. They have some kind of border security. But just they manage. So you see drug peddling and all that, no? very easily done there. So <coughs> this, this porous international borders became, uh, became very common and that has affected the peace building. It's every time there's firing, counter firing, as you know. So this is a problem. Now opening the transborder trade routes, you know that Northeastern India has got very old trade routes, uh, which was shut after Second World War. Some of the trade routes are opened, like this um, Steelwell uh, Road. And, but then they say that when you open the border, other people are using that route for, for insurgency, for, 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 uh, you know, for other kinds of violence, because this also gives the opportunity to come in and out and terrorism. So uh, uh, trans-border terrorism is, is, is easier when you have an official route or transborder connection, uh, they, they use it. The political uncertainty in the Northeast India affected India's relation with the border states for the alleged patronization of the Northeast Indian states. Now, this is a very interesting thing. India is blaming Bangladesh, Myanmar, that you are giving asylum to our people. I mean, sorry, not asylum. You are, you are giving training to, our, to the insurgents. That is why they get it. Patroni and get all patronization from your country and the country. So that has 
you know, of course, perhaps uh, Bangladesh also <laughs> accuses India for uh, the same thing in their country. But in Bangladesh, certain parts there are insurgents. So <clears throat> there are mutual recriminations. But by and large, these have affected the, the, the international relation with the, with the Indian states. <clears throat> Now, there have been a lot of summits, you know, investment summits, and the chief ministers of the, we have seven or eight states in North East, they meet every year. These are annual summits. This is called investment summit. They have stressed time and again on security issues, governance, and institutional restructuring for the same. And they have taken lots of uh, policy measures to control, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the rule of law situation in so governance and peace building. Northeastern Council as a body, so it's almost parallel to a planning body for the Northeast, <coughs> it was redefined, its role was redefined, and security was made one of the mandatory functions of the Northeastern Council uh, uh, with the development functions. So the security and development are combined with the NEC, all NEC mandate uh, in today's context. The border security becomes state responsibility. It's basically a state responsibility. So India adopted the following strategies. No border sealing, <coughs> but border fencing. Border cannot be sealed today in today's context. Increased vigil along with the border. So we will find that lots of army and border security forces deployed on the, on the line. Deployment of second line of defense. Strengthen intelligence network in the villages and international border, tighten law and order situation, uh, secure cooperation with the border states for peace building and diplomatic relations with the border states. These are some of the officials, you know, official measures that the government can can adopt in order to build relationship with the neighboring countries and to reduce the government threat in the country. Uh, um, of course, the state like Manipur, they have the special police of their SPO, special, and there's a special program, and the youth are weaponized to control. The, this is this is given by the state. We give you the weapon, you manage your village. So this is something, and this has been highly criticized also. That this has been done in uh, some other parts of India, in, um, state, the Pradesh, and the uh, so they said that this is uh, this is this is you are you are you are you are earning them uh, so that they can guard their village and in that process there is division within the villages. If the youth hold a gun, no, I'm not going to cooperate with them. I'm afraid. Who knows nowadays? <laughs> you know. So this is uh, this is breaking the social bond and village bond. This. This when when there is uh, you police the local people with the state power, they're giving some kind of police function. They call the SPO, special police officers. In uh, Manipur, this this has been started. SPO mm -hmm. and SPO uh, has been criticized by various human rights organizations and peace building organizations. But don't do this. Weapon cannot be the answer for you. There may be other ways. Please don't do it. But what to do? Government is always, you know, st nature of the state is always like that. They, they are not, not very, you know, they can't take the softer approach to peace building. And there are, uh, we, we have many examples. I am working in the development sector. How uh, in Assam there is an organization where promoting the peace crops. They have nothing to do with weapons and violence. But by love and affection and team building, cooperation, they are, they are doing it. And as a result, uh, there are lots of uh, people are surrendering guns. So let's follow this type of easy things. No, why should we go for gun for gun? This may not solve India's problem at least for India. This is for sure. So this is one more thing. Now I come to the third point: trade investment in infrastructure. This is the heartland of uh, heart, in the heart of the economic reforms, which which also which the LEP also tries to promote. <coughs> uh, closer tries. Uh, it should be Southeast Asia as well as South Asia. Uh, and the look East policy stands for closer economic ties with the Southeast Asia as well as South Asia. Uh, there is one advantage that is socio-cultural resemblances. Just now this, this girl was telling me that look, there are many people who, are, who belong to the same clan, same community, but living in other side of the national border. 
So this, this, this is an added advantage for relationship building as well as for economic cooperation. It's not an alien, Burma is not an alien land for India, for, uh, for not just in India. In many ways, no? because many relatives are there in beyond the border and their relatives are staying in India. So, you know, the, the criticality is that the, 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 the kinship bondage, kinship, the, the, the clan boundary uh, and the state boundary, political boundary overlap with each other. And this overlapping uh, by political uh, boundary, you are different. But by clan, you are my own man. So if you go to Burma border, there are many, many households. No, this is Burma, this is India. Your kitchen is in India and your reward is in Burma. So you have to pay two types of taxes. I don't know how to manage it. It's very subject to investigation. The land goes like this. There are some areas uh, which, is, which has got a river that uh, divides India and Burma. But you go to the hill areas and, you know, so it goes like this. So very delicate. And they said that that is why, you know, uh, Cross-border violence is very common. I just step in India, throw something, and come back. And the government can do nothing. Because I'm here in Burma. And again, from Burma, somebody is coming and throwing something in India, and go to Burma. Indian army can't do nothing. There was a great incident, of you. there is a community called Paite. Chin. Paite. Paite. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they did some action in India and uh, on the border. And the Indian uh, border police arrested them and tortured them, elected shock and all that. And that became a human rights issue in Manipur. <laughs> and one lady who was, who was a human rights activist, very powerful, said that I've seen how Indian police can give shock therapy to the young boys. So <laughs> such things are happening, you know, because of this, of this kind of Territoriality and and clan boundary, territorial boundaries and clan boundaries, they, this this cannot be separated in the real sense of the term. Now, what are the infrastructure building initiatives? Let's see whether India Myanmar Thai Highway connecting Moray with Maoshat town in Northern Thailand by Bagan town in central Myanmar. This is and this is a highway. Asian highway project linking northeast to the rest of India through Dhaka and to the Southeast Asian states. Intra Northeast network through NS and EW corridors, north, south, and east, west corridors. This, this construction is almost complete. Almost one is linking uh, Gujarat and uh, Burma, that is like this, and the uh, system Kashmir or somewhere in then to South India. So this is, a, uh, this is a cross, one is horizontal under this uh, uh, vertical corridors. India Myanmar Friendship Road. Is another trans Asian highway revival of the vintage steel wheel route. It was revived a few years back, two years back. So, so as to promote trade, business, and you know, to develop uh, inter uh, state relationships. <coughs> then, special accelerated road development program in Northeast India, which is going on in full swing. Reopening of Nathula Pass on India China border. These passes were closed down after the, after the war. Now they are trying. To, they are going to open it. Still, in port in uh, in in, in situ a port in Myanmar. These ports are also also shut down. But now they are they are trying to develop those. Then <coughs> there is developing a national waterway two starts from Assam and extends to Bangladesh. Very close, but this it's called national waterways two. This is a new initiative. Strengthening international trade infrastructure between India and Bangladesh with special focus on Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, Mizoram, and border uh, and that border with Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh is now trying very hard to build relationships with India. Every day, newspapers are giving you information, telling us that we are doing this, we are doing that. Let's come together. <coughs> and say it is just the other side of the of the land. It's not a different, distinct land as such. And Bangladesh is also, you know half circled by Indian territories on this side of Bengal. So the, it, ha it, it has to do with India a lot. <coughs> and then in the, so certain border towns have been and developed, land castle stations are, 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 are being constructed and EPZ and SEZ areas are coming. These are some of the infrastructure building initiatives uh, going on in the Northeast. Certain <coughs> 
uh, institutional initiatives are there to promote trade investment and infrastructure that include investor-friendly state policies. If you look at the state policies of uh, almost all the states, seven to eight states, uh, the power sector reform, they say, that is not just in the industrial policy. Uh, uh, plus there are state policies. One is regional policy, the water policy is there. So they're trying to develop these policies so that investors can come and uh, can come and give some kind of I mean, make some kind of investment in the region and sectoral policies, all the sectors, including agriculture, industry, um, small scale industries, in all sectors of economy, there is and there's some kind of policy for. And besides this, there is border trade agreements and diplomatic initiatives between Southeast Asia and South Asian countries. The, the, this is also an ongoing process. And last but not least, enforcement system is being strengthened. And the, the to maintain the law and order situation and to uh, for the purpose of trade. Now, there are certain problems which are problematic areas in this kind of thing. <coughs> Uh, um, I'll just I've just noted down a few lines. The first is that the contradiction between Northeast India as a bioecological region, administrative region, and an economic region. Northeast India has been conceived and reconceived again and again in history. In the British days, it was uh, you know uh, excluded area and all that. When uh, China attacked India, it was called this very sensitive zone. The, the people are a sensitive zone when economic reforms came, they said that it is prosperous economic zone. So various kinds of uh, visualizing Northeast India. And that, that, that made the region very complex. How you take Northeast India as, a, as an economically prosperous zone, or as a strategically important zone, or a, or a border state with uh, you know, all sorts of nuisances. So <laughs> that's the criticality of, of, of the region. <coughs> Uh, uh, and the other is the conflict and cooperation between the northeast and the neighboring states. Now, you see, all the neighbors, ne neighboring states that are there in, uh, in the map, uh, there are two things. One is that the proximity, the border proximity is not value based. On the one hand, they are saying that we will go to China, we will go to this and that, we will to get seceded from India. But if you see their internal relationships, they are not. So the proximity they, that they have with the border states, or even within themselves, you know, <coughs> some some Manipur border conflict, Nagaland and Assam border conflict is a perennial thing. Sixty years on, oh, nothing was done. Every time they say that, oh, you have taken this much of land, this is our area. So this is not value-based proximity. This is rather you can call it accidental proximity within the region and accidental proximity beyond the border. So all the bordering states of Northeast India, with which we dream a lot that Bangladesh, Myanmar, Tibet, China, Bhutan will be one one unit of cooperation and some kind of regional development to take place. Perhaps has got lots of you know, criticalities. So until and unless these you know these these proximities are regularized as value-based proximities, that, well, this is a this is a proximity which which will benefit me, which will benefit each other. Nothing is going to be done. So this is another. <coughs> Another the criticality uh, uh, and at the social level, see the, the social relations. We talk of, of, of clan, of kinship bonds, of territorial bonds and all that. But the, but the multiple combination of social relations in the region created difference of opinion in the Indo-Dest. The social relations are not given. If you see the Chakmas of Northeast, Chakmas are, 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 are changing their identities. If you see the Nagas of Manipur, the, the, or the cookies of Manipur, many cookies are now getting aligned to the Naga group, Naga axis. They say, no, 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 we are not cookies, we are Nagas. So, <laughs> how do you define the internal social relations? These are not given fixed social relations. And perhaps this has larger implication for trade, commerce, industry, and development. And we'll have to investigate on this point much more, uh, uh, how how social relations can impact um, economic development, and impact trade and, uh, and trade and um, uh, you know, exchanges. Um, if you see the border uh, trade between India and Burma, which community is doing the border trade? 
it is it is the mainstream manipuri women who are selling very pretty things 18 or 20 articles are allowed to trade with burma that includes local vegetable <laughs> that includes local uh, you know local things and they are sitting because they are more powerful there. whereas other there are other groups of people who, who are not uh, getting a seat in the market so uh, you know so that is how they have manipulated the business space the ladies of Manipur are going head loaded with uh, you know, trades, the bottoms, these are the goods that they sell. And then pumpkin and there's <laughs> watermelons, <laughs> these are the things that, that are, are being traded. Of course, I'm not talking about the, the, the other things, those contrabands that, that I'm not going to that. So who occupies the space? <coughs> and the business is therefore is not of scale. The, the border business, border trade is not of scale. Uh, uh, um, so, a people to people contact for economic cooperation is difficult to obtain. So, we'll have to see how we can take trade and business uh, to the people and uh, we, we can engage the people so that you can think that oh, it's not some big organization, big business house that is selling. You can think that if you have a local product, handloom product, you come and sell to me, like you know, in, in Northeast, there are lots of. Ladies who come think with things hold it, head loaded. It may be, uh, it may be, and it may be, uh, you know, egg. It may be rice, and then come to your doorstep. Hello, you want some eggs? I, I can sell you. So this is door to door business uh, done by that, and that that makes a human relationship also. They will give you on credit that okay, I have no money, but I need say ten eggs. Give me today, I'll give me the money tomorrow, and that goes uh, with trust and faith. But uh, this is how. This is where the people to people contact for economic cooperation is necessary beyond the borders. It may not look the same, but uh, anyway, have to see what, what shape it takes. Uh, now, in the Lucas policy, if you see what's happening, the major focus is on security issues. More focus on security issues than development and trade issues. That is one of the critical points of the policy. Everybody go first, 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 uh, the component will be peace building, security. Then we'll talk about other, you know, other things, uh, inter uh, interstate or intrastate, trade, business, promotion of, uh, 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 of, uh, of um, markets and whatever. So the, 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 the security issue is being foregrounded time and again in all the midst of the, of the chief ministers, prime ministers, the policy makers. First, First item is security and peace, and that is occupying the entire discussion time. So very less time is spent for real development. If you say by the end of the day that what happened to to, to this particular trade, how do why don't you include other items uh, and make it uh, 40 or 60 or 80 items? People, people have more to give. There are lots of handicrafts you can give it to for sale. First item is security, peace. And that takes all the two hours of meeting and they say, okay, thank you, meeting is closed today. So this is how, you know, the regional discourse is happening. <laughs> the lesser, lesser importance on, 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 on trade issues. Uh, so, uh, so the trade, uh, trade and development could not become a continental issue as such. It became very much cramped and crowded, you know, uh, cramped and small uh, initiative in the entire locust policy. <coughs> Core periphery gap is always there. It was there in the liberal economy, it was there in the colonial economy, and look at policy. Uh, also, we see the core periphery gap is not being addressed in a very effective manner. That you know, core and periphery, it's a very old discourse, you know, but then as we have, we are talking about globalization, liberalization, movement across the countries and markets. <coughs> so, core and periphery shouldn't have any line of distinction. There should not be any fissure line between core and periphery. The concept of core is now being deconstructed. Hmm? If you have promoted economic zone, why you are you are talking about core periphery? So these are some of the logical, you know, complexities that that um, uh, you know disturb uh, the, 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 the 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 larger thinking about economic development. Communication and trade rules are there, old, very old communication and trade rules. If you go back to history, Sir has gone to Silchar, 
you may tell me that how many roots, trade roots are there in South. Those days, those trade roots have disappeared uh, for some reason or other. And uh, Chitrathuram Hill and then Narit and this uh, um, uh, waterways, lots of traders used to go there to, to different countries. Those are the old, old mercantile economy of, of, of Northeast. What those roads are gone? If we are to, if we are to evolve a larger uh, regional cooperation, we need waterways very much. We need land connections also very much. Not necessarily air. Air is always costly and it's not affordable to the common people. But what happened to those uh, traditional mercantile roads? It needs to re we need to reinvestigate those things and to see how far those can uh, be, uh, you know, uh, re-established or uh, you know, <coughs> rediscovered uh, for better communication and trade. Then, lastly, uh, one more thing is the border restriction of the of the people. Border restriction of, of the people, of course, in, in, the, in the, uh, the larger uh, um, sense of the term. Movement of natural persons is highly restricted. If you see the WTO rules, mm -hmm. uh, movement of natural persons, that's called mode 4. Mode 4 is not regularized. Mm -hmm. That movement of natural persons. Other things are okay. But, uh, but, but then, then the people cannot move from one place to another. Okay. And there are so many uh, suggestions like work permit regime, this and that. The researches are going on. Suggestions are there. but. Movement of the people are really, really restricted. And not only within, uh, between the two countries, but also within the region. If you are in Assam, it is difficult for you to enter Nagaland and to do business there, or to Mizoram and do a business there. <coughs> uh, so, <laughs> restriction of the, the border restriction of the people there. So, you are an outsider, you, are a, you get lost. We, we, we don't want you to come here. So in this way, I know movement of natural person. Mm -hmm. We have about ten more minutes. So ten minutes. Oh, sure, sure. We have people left to go. Sure, sure, sure. Partition is. We go back to partition. Partition has landlocked the country, entire country, entire region. This this partition also is a is is, a, is a, has cut off many communication routes. Uh, 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 inland river routes became restricted. Border trade is not of scale. As I have already told you, limited items and limited trading zones on the borders. It's very, very good. lesser scale of trade. Deprivation and <laughs> deprivation of credibility of regional goods and services. If you see the nature of the goods that they sell, 40 items, I think, you see all made of, made from, uh, made in Bombay or Delhi or some other industrial places, local goods are not being promoted. Whereas perhaps Local people would have been much more benefited had they been able to sell their handicrafts and other things. And inflow of and flood of foreign goods in the border trade. If you bring something from it, made in China, made in Thailand, what do you know that? So what is your local economy getting integrated into larger economy? So these are some of the criticalities um, that I could share with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's some questions. So. Can I ask a question? Um, when you mentioned that uh, like people cannot move freely among the states, like how exactly is it controlled? Like the mobilization? You see, one is that we, if you think from global angle, movement of people should should be part of it. I can go to your house. You can come to my house. And that makes our bond, not only social bond, but also economic. I'll, I'll try, I'll be able to know that you produce this thing. Mm. And it needs movement of people. If you come to uh, Northeast India and see how, again, accidental proximity, uh, not value-based proximity, you also, you are a Naga, you are a Mizo. No, 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 you go, go back. In it's Manipur, ethnic, ethnic diversity. Ethnic, yeah, this is it's also been government sponsored, though. Yeah, I mean, the Indian yeah. government brought Nepalis yeah, yeah, against yeah. the Nagas to That's suffer right. them against the Bengalis. That's right. And they use and one so community against the other. The government of India has really used ethnic diversity to try to control yes, sir. Con conflict between yeah. groups. Yeah. And, and even because of that, a lot of people aren't allowed to settle now. Yeah. So there's very strict rules about if you're from this area, you have right, to stay in this right, area. Right, right. 
and even the big businessmen, they can play game with you. They, they will give money to them, they stop those people not to come here. Then there are many traders, petty traders. If they come, their trade will be reduced. So they said, you know, I'll, 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 I have the monopoly of, uh, you know, there is a big uh, business, uh, Bodiman's Mansion in Ceylon. Mm -hmm. Bodi Mansion, that is near this police bazaar. <coughs> that, that, that is one of the biggest trade centers owned by some Marwari business community. No, they don't allow, they don't like that any other people should come and compete. They want the smaller but things. But Marwari only came in much later. Yeah, they, no, they came in the British period, sir. Very few. Very, of course, very few and very rich. <laughs> but now they have very student interest. Oh, yeah. Also, no uh, they, you can't buy land in, in Ceylon, being an outsider. Mm -hmm. But somehow they married the local girls and, you know, met, uh, met local society, classes and met local. So land is somehow, somewhat, you know, uh, ladies and girls have control of the land. So once they marry an outsider, they give land. Okay, you make a house, do some business. And lots of people doing business, very silly people. <laughs> and I'm saying money, and uh, I don't know what happens at last. They take the advantage of this, you know, the social system. Uh, otherwise, you know, they are also uh, playing the junker role for, for, for you know, the ordinary people to come in and come you know, and go, come in and go. They won't get trade licenses. You know, if you are a vegetable vendor in the market, in the registered market, you need to have. Uh, so some people have to go for a class. Okay, thank you. So these are some of the, you know, basically ethnic, but uh, it became economic also, and a narrow economic interest. Okay. Please say something more about the um, so you said that in the infrastructure part, your last point, there was this establishment of community information center at the block level. Yeah, this is a new issue. It's like the EPZ and the SCZs. Yeah. Um, what is that? So, hmm. what exactly does these um, community information these centers These information do centers, the, the, some, of, some of the centers have, uh, are, are, are been established at block levels. Uh, you know, these centers are basically for, you know, for, for sharing information on, on market. Okay. Uh, with the help of computer, they can tell you that this is the market, today's price is this, today's price is that. So this is at the community level. So very much at uh, the management. Uh, this is e-marketing e uh, information. You can take it easily. Mm -hmm. Electronic marketing uh, management system. So they can tell you if you if you have a, have say uh, say uh, sugar cane, you don't know what to sell. Mm -hmm. So you go there in the center. This and they have some. Right. You know, from there you can look at oh that's the market that is the rate. Mm -hmm. So I can take the track loaded things to. Right. Place and, and are they managed by the local governments? Or this is a critical or? area because block level, uh, when they do it, no, there are government officers also as well as um, you know, non-government organizations. Okay. But this is yet to take a very strong shape mm -hmm. because managing a community right. information center, right. and if you come to Delhi, I'll show you Rajasthan, there are lots of community centers which are tagged with uh, Panchayati Raj office. Mm -hmm. You know, Panchayat Raj right, is right, the right, right. local government's unit. So it, it needs to be further institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Simply to, talking about information center is one thing, but the operational aspect of it is much more important. Otherwise, the information center yeah. can give you wrong information. So while going to left, you go to the right, mm -hmm. and you are lost. Yeah. Do you know if any, um, so these I imagine in, are in the northeast India part, these block information centers that you are talking about? These are all blocks. There are as many as districts. Every but district has. Would you know of um, any specific center that is considered like a successful? That has no, been I had able? no research on this as yet. Oh. Okay. It, it, these are just upcoming things now. Right. The problem is that once it is, it is, uh, it becomes really institutionalized, mm -hmm. then we'll be able to tell. Then the state will take over. <laughs> Once it becomes successful, then the state will take yeah, over. Yeah, so the state the will take over, revenue. state will intervene, <laughs> the best of interests will intervene. So there are lots of criticalities and problems. Well, thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate you coming and presenting to us. Thank you.